Okay, so recall that all matter is made of atoms. Atoms are made of a densely packed nucleus where you'll have positive charges. And orbiting around the densely packed nucleus of an atom, there are negatively charged electrons. All of interesting chemistry and all of X-ray production has to do with how do uh, electrons interact with other electrons, okay? So our electrons, the ones we've been talking about making at the filament, getting a bunch of them in the cloud at the filament, sending them across a gap at a high rate of speed, we're going to smash them into a wall now. We want to know how they interact with that wall, okay? Because the interaction with the anode face, the wall, will govern um, what type of x-rays are produced. There's two possibilities here. Atoms have a nucleus and they've, they have orbiting electrons, so you can either interact with an orbiting electron or you can interact with the forces of the nucleus of an atom. An atom's nucleus has a net positive charge. The orbiting electrons have negative charges. The atom as a whole is, is neutrally charged. Okay. So we're going to come into a neutrally charged atom and kind of disrupt the place with our projectile electrons, okay? The projectile electrons are the ones that we're sending across the gap, okay? From cathode to anode, filament to anode. All right, here we go. This is the, this is the finishing stuff for equipment operation, the most important part of this. What are the x-rays we're producing? What do we call them? What are their types? How do we characterize them? The first type of x-rays that we produce are called Bremsstrahlung x-rays, okay? Bremsstrahlung is a German word which means breaking radiation. Call them Brems rays or Brems x-rays. Don't call them Bremsstrahlung because it's a big word and I don't like saying big words when I don't have to, okay? It saves time. Except the long explanation of that does not save time. But in the long run, I think we're going to save time. <laughs> um, okay, Brems radiation, right? Um, Brems radiation is when our projectile electrons interact with the nucleus, uh, the nuclear forces of the atoms in the face of the anode. So we're running the uh, electrons into the anode face, and in this case, this type is when electrons interact with the nucleus. So a couple notes here that are important. Your nucleus in an atom, this guy here in the center, has the protons. Protons in an atom are the positive charges that exist only in the nucleus, okay? Again, I, I want to emphasize, don't worry about what positive means and what negative means. Just remember that negative and positive are opposites of each other, okay? They mean something, but it does not matter for our purposes. Just positive is one thing, negative is, a, is, is the exact opposite, okay? Opposite charges attract and like charges will repel each other. Kind of like magnets, north pole, south poles, right? Attract, north pole, north pole repels, okay? Positive and positive charges repel, negative and negative charges repel, but a positively charged nucleus of an atom can pull on the negatively charged projectile electron, okay? Positive attraction of the nucleus pulls the electron toward it as the electron is trying to just pass by it slows it down. In the formula for kinetic energy, what were the two things that you needed to know to, know to know kinetic energy? You needed to know the mass and the velocity. And given some mass and some velocity, you have some kinetic energy number, right? If you s lower the velocity number, what happens to the kinetic energy number? It goes down, right? If velocity goes down, kinetic energy goes down. We know energy is conserved, so if kinetic energy goes down, the energy that we lost, lost in air quotes, had to go somewhere, right? Kinetic energy converts into electromagnetic energy from electrons, okay? Whereas a car hitting a wall converts into sound and heat and blah, blah, blah. In this case, electrons convert their energy of motion into electromagnetic waves. So you, we'll, we'll look at a little bit, uh, um, some numbers here in a second, but you have from right to left, you have an atom right in the center. You have from right to left a projectile electron coming into an atom. It happens to pass near enough to the nucleus of the atom to where the nucleus can reach out and pull on it, right? 
it's not the same, but kind of similar to, um, you know, a, a, an asteroid passing by Earth, right? If an asteroid flying through the solar system passes very close to Earth, Earth's gravity can pull on the asteroid and make it kind of change its path, okay? But if that asteroid is very far away from Earth, it won't interact with Earth's gravity and won't be pulled on, and the asteroid will just continue on its path. The closer that asteroid is to Earth, the more Earth pulls on it. If it's close enough to Earth, Earth, Earth will pull on it so much that that asteroid will enter Earth's atmosphere and crash down to the ground and hit the ground, and we have a big asteroid explosion. Okay, that's what happened to the dinosaurs. Yeah? In a simplistic way of looking at that, the rainbow takes light and splits it into different vibrations. Yeah. So at those different vibrations, and then light scaling is that idea to this, the different vibrations equal x-rays. Or, or one of those vibrations Yes. Yes, in, in a way, in a, but in, in that, in what you're talking about, you're talking about light coming from the sun, electromagnetic waves, right, light, right. hitting matter and, 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 and splitting those wavelengths up into, into discrete right, sections, right. right? In this case, it's not light interacting with matter making light, it is um, electrons right. interacting right. with matter. Right, as an analogy, it, it kind of works, yeah. Um, the difference here is that the electrons have a negative, have an, have an electric charge where a light has no net charge. So that's, a, that's one difference. But as an analogy, sure. Um, again, the point is the positively charged nucleus will pull on the negatively charged electron. The negatively charged electron is very small and light. It's about 2,000 times smaller than one proton. Okay, and in tungsten you have what 74 protons, right? So you have this big massive nucleus of this atom pulling on the or the, the projectile electron. They both pull on each other, okay? But the nucleus is so much bigger, it doesn't go anywhere. It's also locked into kind of the solid shape of the anode, right? So what happens is the electron gets pulled in close to the nucleus, changes its course, loses kinetic energy, it, it exits the atom going slower than it entered, okay? So it, it is, ah, you guys need to tell me when I leave that on the floor. <laughs> leave that up there. It's a lot clearer when that's not there. So it enters at one velocity, it exits at a lower velocity, right? The difference in entrance energy and exit energy is emitted as a photon, okay? Exactly the energy that it lost in velocity is how much energy that, that photon will have. Okay. So the, the electron that ejected the other electron... Not, we're not there yet. Oh, no, no, in this, oh. in, in Brehm's x-rays, the atom has not lost or gained anything. Okay? The atom is, you're not interacting with the orbiting electrons in this case. We will. So there's two ways you can do this, right? The projectile electron can interact with the nucleus of the atom where it pull, the, the nucleus pulls on the electron causing it to lose speed. The lost speed is converted into an x-ray photon. The other way to do this, which I'm not talking about right now, um, is to kick out an orbiting electron and have this whole cascade of electrons falling down into the, uh, from shell level to shell level. We will get there. Um, but right now, projectile electron comes in, has some force pulling on it, slows down, loses energy, the amount of energy lost is emitted as a photon. I'll give you more in just a second. Let's get some more notes down. Um, the majority of your x-ray beam are Brehm's x-rays. If you didn't have Brehm's x-rays, you could not make an x-ray image. If, if this type of interaction just were somehow, you know, not permitted by the laws of physics, we couldn't make x-rays, okay? X-rays would not, um, we wouldn't have subject contrast, okay? So here's the deal. Because the electrons coming from cathode to anode can be traveling at all different speeds, they have like an average speed, right? But some of them are going slow, some of them are going fast, and then some of them are doing the average, the ones going fast have more kinetic energy, right? The ones going slow have less. The ones going fast can make a more energetic x-ray because they have more kinetic energy to lose. And the electrons traveling slowly have less energy to lose, so cannot make as energetic of an x-ray. So what you get is you get a range of x-ray energies, a broad range of x-ray energies. 
On top of that, the electrons can pass at different distances from the nucleus. Some of them pass very close, others pass very far. Those that pass very close to the nucleus are pulled on more, lose more velocity, and those that are very far away from an atom's nucleus are pulled on less, losing less velocity. So you can see how you build up, because of the different ways the electrons can interact with the face of the anodes, uh, the, new, the atoms in the face of the anode, there are different ways, different energies that can be produced. So you'll produce many different energies with Brehm's x-rays. We say the x-ray beam, because of that, is made up of many different energies, and our word for that is heterogeneous. Genius for created, generated, hetero for um, different, many different ones. You can also say the x-ray beam is polyenergetic. This is hugely important. If we didn't, if this didn't happen, you see why it's important to know about kinetic energy because it's all about how much kinetic energy is lost here, right? And if you didn't know about kinetic energy and how velocity matters, which is the point of showing those equations, you wouldn't know why the x-ray beam was made of many different energies. So even though you're not actually hands-on doing the kinetic energy calculations, it's you got to know why, right? Why that? Why we talk about it? This is why. Yeah. I think this is just probably something that I didn't pay a lot of attention to. Um, for like the longest time, it makes sense now. <laughs> so, well, you're at the end. It should start making yeah. sense. <laughs> so all of the all of the X-rays that are produced by the Brem Bremstrahl lung, that's the that's like the biggest quantity of X-ray production from from the from the machine. Um, so because they come in all kinds of different speeds, the ones that get attenuated are the lower ones. Now it makes them, at least in my head, it makes more sense how the image is formed on the other side because the fastest going X-rays that don't interact with something in the body, the ones with the most energy are the ones that will reach the image receptor, and the lower energy ones are the ones that get attenuated. Yes, use use terms for the X-rays of low energy and high energy. You can't say fast and slow. Because x-rays all travel at the same speed, right? The only difference between one x-ray photon and another is its wavelength, right? High energy wave x-rays are short wavelength. Low energy x-rays are longer wavelength. But it's not faster or slower. Oh, yeah. But you had everything else perfect. But I did that too when I was a student. I talked about fast and slow. And you can't because x-rays all travel at the light, speed of light. So you can say high energy, low energy. So everything else you said was perfect. So just replace the, that term. Okay. So because our x-ray beam is made of many energies many different energies of x-rays. As Javier is saying, some of them pass through the body, others get absorbed in the body, others scatter off of different parts of the body. Because the x-rays are made of many energies, you can have an image of the body with different shades of gray, okay? Some x-rays pass through. Those x-rays that pass right through the body and hit the image receptor, higher energy ones, they're gonna make black spots of the image receptor. Those are your black parts of the image. Some x-rays are completely absorbed by the body. Those are the lower energy ones. Those are going to make the white spots on your image. And then everything in between there gives you your gray stuff. Okay? Your x-ray beam has to be made up of a wide range of energies. It must be polyenergetic. This gives you your subject contrast in the remnant beam. This is what's providing you your shades of gray on the x-ray image. Without this you would have an image like is on the left. If your x-ray beam only had x-rays that either passed through the body or didn't, then you would only have black or white, okay? And so you would get an image like, it, like my laser pointer centered on on the left, right? We don't, we get many shades of gray available, long scale of contrast because of Brehm's x-rays. Without subject contrast, it would be impossible to produce diagnostic x-rays, and without Brehm's radiation, we don't have polyenergetic beam. We can't make diagnostic x-rays without that. So yes, this lets us do things like see subtle tissue differences like fat pads that are shown um, when we have bleeding around a bone uh, because of trauma, usually a fracture. Bone marrow absorbs different portions of the beam, so we can demonstrate the inside, the medulla of the bone, the medullary cavity of the bone, differently from the cortex of the bone. Let me go back to this picture. 
Notice how you can tell where the bright white edge of the bone is and where the dark center of the bone is, right? You can see the difference between those. Without Brehm's rays, you would just have a, a big white piece of bone, okay? Um, and we wouldn't have the diagnostic capabilities that we do. Those arrows are pointing to a slight dark area right there that without Brehm's rays, we could not see. Hard to see when it's up on the screen like this, but it's there. So when, so when doctors are looking at, the doctors are looking at soft tissue. Yes. And they see like I looked at that and I was like, okay, there's some arrows there, but I don't see it. Sure. But obviously we we don't have a great so. Great representation of the image. This is not a diagnostic display monitor. Not a, right, right. right. But what I'm, what I'm getting to is, so when a doctor is looking at that on a diagnostic display, and they see that slightly dark hair, they go, oh, that's, that's what they're seeing yeah. when they're looking for a tumor. Yeah, yeah. Okay. They're looking at differences in tissue density, right? An area that should, in like, let's say it's like the lungs, right? An area that should not be dense and be black like the lung field, now you see a little spot in the lung field that looks white, right? It's a right. dense area that absorbed the x-ray beam. It looks like a little circumcised, circumscribed, circumcised. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, that got recorded. It looks like a little, I don't edit these by the way. It looks like a little circumscribed um, sphere, right, in the right. chest. Right. And that dense area could be a, a mass, right? Um, where, uh, you know, um, uh, Taylor was talking about a guy who had fluid in his lungs and they found that fluid by doing two things. Before you took the x-ray, the doctor oscillated the lungs and listened to the lungs. He, can he, he or she can hear the fluid, right? But then you take the x-ray and we can see the fluid in the lungs because fluid is denser than air and it shouldn't be there. So we see a dense spot in the bottom of the lungs. Fluid goes down, we see a nice dense spot. That dense spot is where the x-rays were absorbed. So uh, yeah, we're, the <clears throat> physicians are looking at what we, we they know what normal density should be there, right? Then they look for for a pathology. They look for changes in density. It's one thing to look for. Okay, so uh, now a slightly related question. So within a medical facility, are are there specific display screens that are diagnostic mm -hmm. and those that are not? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Um, and then how do you know that you're you got it? So you know it, it goes by the resolution of the monitor. So um, the monitors that the physicians use, so they, they class them. I, I might get this wrong, but physicians monitors are class one monitors with high resolution. And the monitors we get in our x-ray rooms are called workstation monitors, not diagnostic displays. And they are lower resolution. I believe they call those class two so, monitors. So in the, in the setup of whatever the facility, we make some desk spaces right. for the doctors, right. those have to be the high resolution the, monitors. The, the monitor they're looking at the x-rays on to diagnose disease are high quality diagnostic monitors. The monitors that radiologists use in their rooms, they have the two side-by-side -side monitors in their rooms, those are high quality diagnostic monitors used for diagnosing disease. Right. The ones we have on our x-ray room are not diagnostic because what are we using the monitor for in the x-ray room? I mean, you've done x-ray. What, what are we using the monitor for? Just, just to check that we have the image. To see our image, right? right? To look for the image qualities. We want to see that it's got enough you know, density. We got enough contrast. We can see detail. We got the positioning right. Right? We're not looking to diagnose disease. We're looking, did we make a satisfactory image? Right? Because we don't need it for diagnosis, our monitors are lower resolution. They're usually smaller and also lower resolution. You want a good image? And I only really ask sure. because, um, you know, I'm, I'm assuming that at some point, you know, they're doing something in a what was your medical facility and they say, a, uh, they ask the, a, a flood 90 at Proton Mail. They ask you as a tech, you know, some, some information or what do we need to do? Right. Yeah, so or they're trying to set up stuff and they start asking some questions and you know. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. So you said to hope send it. Okay. Yeah. Something you wanted me to show the class or is this just should well, just I mean, yeah, it's, it's kind of what you were doing, just okay. Uh, okay. Exactly. okay. We'll talk for a little while and we'll see if we can all right. So um, let me give you some more on Brems, okay? Um, so again, BREMS are the reason we have diagnostic x-rays. It's not the whole story, it's half the story. I guess it's the majority of the story, but um, let's look at BREMS a little bit, and maybe you'll get a little better feel for this, okay? So um, in this example, 
we've got an example of the green is the atom. Both shades of green are the atom. So you see the nucleus and you see the, the, the overall greenish big circles. Okay, that represents the outer, outer edges of the atom. What you're not showing are the electrons because Brems x-rays don't interact with electrons. Or Brems, making Brems radiation, we don't care about the electrons. So consider two electrons traveling at the same velocity. They both have 60 kV worth of energy, okay? Don't worry about what the velocity is, but they both have 60 kV worth of energy, okay? Two electrons. One of them passes very close to the nucleus. That's the one on the bottom, the line on the bottom. The other passes far away from the nucleus. In this case, the one that passed very close to the nucleus, because it's closer, the nucleus pulls on it more. It changes direction more uh, at, a, at a more extreme angle and loses more. It exits the atom with less kinetic energy. Okay, its, it's energy went down to 20 kilovolts. So we lost between entering and exiting 40 kilovolts. Right? We know that the energy has to go somewhere. It gets converted into an X-ray photon, a, a, a particle, a piece of an X-ray beam. Okay, just like a water wave is made up of many small pieces of water. The X-ray beam is made up of many small particles of, of X-rays. Your flashlight coming out of your uh, flashlight, the light coming out of your flashlight, is made up of many small pieces of visible light. A photon is one piece of light. This is an X-ray photon. It's one piece of an X-ray beam. This one will exit. Will, will, so we've now produced an X-ray. That X-ray has 40 kV worth of energy. X-rays travel at the same speed. Okay, we won't, this is not for this section, but x-rays, all electromagnetic waves are massless. They don't have any mass. All x-rays have no mass. All visible light has no mass. Imagine if you were being struck by like massive light all the time. Wouldn't be a very fun thing for it to happen, right? So x-rays and all visible light is massless. Doesn't weigh anything. It's not matter, okay? They all travel at the speed of light and in straight lines. Okay, so all x-ray photons travel at 3 times 10 to the 8 meters per second and no other speed ever, okay? In straight lines, they have no mass and no electric charge. That's interesting. An electron has a negative electric charge. We took the electron and we got rid of its velocity, right? The electron exiting here is still the same electron that entered the atom. Okay, remember, mass of the electron, charge of the electron are conserved quantities. So this electron, which has slowed down less energy when it comes out, it's not lost any charge. In order, if the X-ray photon were going to have a charge, we would have to get it from the electron. The electrons don't lose charge, it's a conserved thing. Therefore, X-rays and all visible light and all electromagnetic waves cannot have electric charge, okay? Massless, chargeless, travels at the speed of light in straight lines only, okay? The straight lines only thing is important because you probably know that visible light can bend. What do we call bending of, of light? focusing, like you guys who have glasses or contacts, you're focusing light additionally because you have some error of refraction with your eyeballs, okay? V light bending is called refraction. Light bouncing off of something is called reflection. X-rays cannot refract, they can't bend on their path, and they can't reflect, okay? Um, you know, when the sun sets, when the sun's right up ahead, uh, on top of you, what colors do you see? Yellow. Hopefully you guys know what color the sun is when it's on top of you. It's yellow, right? Um, when the sun sets at the end of the day, and it gets to dip down below the horizon, what colors do you see in the sky? Oranges, pinks, reds, nice beautiful shades of other colors, right? All of those colors are lower on the energy spectrum than, than yellow light is, okay? The light from the sun as it dips down the horizon has to wrap around the atmosphere to get to you, right? And 
Doing that causes it to lose energy. Refracting the light around the atmosphere causes it to lose energy, so you see different colors when the sun sets. X-rays cannot refract. They only travel in straight lines. They can hit something and then scatter in a different direction, but that thing that scattered off is a new X-ray photon. So it's more than you need right now, but X-rays have some special pro X-rays have special properties that are different than other things. You can't say an X-ray photon that is less energetic is slower. Okay? These both travel at the same velocity. Consider the incoming electron that's close to the nucleus, loses 40 kV worth of energy and goes out on its merry way, producing an X-ray photon of 40 kV worth of energy. We're showing its wavelength to be short. Okay? Do we care about that electron anymore? No. Not necessarily, right? Unless it continues on its path and interacts with another atom over here. Okay? But if it has lost a sufficient amount of its energy, let's say instead of 20 kilovolt, it were like 2 kilovolt, right? You just got rid of the zero, and it's 2 kilovolts worth of energy now, right? It might not have enough energy, enough velocity, to have another Brems interaction. Or if it did, the interaction that it had would, might only produce like a radio wave, okay? It might not produce an X-ray, okay? Once these electrons lose their velocity, they start producing less and less and less energetic waves, electromagnetic waves. If they lose enough energy, they'll stop producing x-rays. Okay? All right, consider this electron up top. It comes in with the same in initial energy. Okay, so it's both, these two have the same mass, because they're two electrons, electrons have the same mass, and that, then they have to have the same velocity to have the same energy, okay? So these two were the same, the only difference between these two is, this one was close to the nucleus, being pulled on a lot, this one is far away from the nucleus, being pulled on less, okay? So this electron gets to escape only losing 4 kV from incoming to outgoing, okay? It loses 4 kV worth of energy, so the photon that it produces must contain 4 kV worth of energy. We see it come in, comes in with 60, leaves with 56. The photon it produces must have an energy of 4 kV. 4 is less than 40, 10 times less. This has to have 10 times less energy. Okay? Why does this photon have 10 times less energy than that photon? If they came from the same kind of electrons at the same speed. This one's further, right? And it's further, so it is pulled on less, right? It loses less kinetic energy. This one exits the atom traveling faster than this one, okay? This guy might be able to have another Brems interaction down, down the road with some other atom, okay? This guy might or might not. The and this is a spectrum. The closer you get to the nucleus, the more energy you lose, okay? The faster you're traveling, the more energy you have to lose. So that is the point of Brehm's x-rays, and this is why we get to produce an x-ray beam. Now, this is just two, right? But we don't have just two uh, electrons, right? We have billions of billions of electrons being produced in a space charge in that cloud. Remember, one amp of electrons was six billion billion electrons, right? It's not just two, it's six billion billion of them, right? That's so many of them, and all of them have an interaction with the nucleus of an atom, and they all hit the, those nuclei at different distances, producing many different uh, ranges of energy for, in the X-ray beam. Questions here? Okay. Let me show, show you on a graph. Vertical axis is quantity, horizontal axis is voltage. This plotted line shows you at some voltage, what's the quantity that you're producing, okay? You don't need to know what the quantity is. Like, this is not, it could be 50 x-rays, this could be 50 bajillion x-rays, doesn't matter. The quantity, the point it is, is that as you increase voltage, the quantity of X-ray or quantity of Brehm's X-rays that you produce decreases. So, to say it again, with increasing voltages, 
you make less and less and less Brems interactions. Statistically, many more x-rays are produced at low energies than at higher energies. Higher KV produces fewer Brems x-rays. If I set 80 KV, I go over to my unit, I consult my technique chart. You know, let's say I want to do a skull radiograph, right? I'm going to do like a PA Caldwell skull radiograph. It's a specific position of the skull. I consult my technique chart and it doesn't, but it happens to say 80, okay? Okay, the technique chart says 80 KV. I go over to my control console and I set 80 KV, okay? At 80 KV, I'm not making that many... You know, let's say this is 50%. This is maximum, this is minimum, right? Um, I'm producing much less Brems photons at 80 kV than if I was set at, let's say, 60 kV, okay? The number that lines up with here is roughly 5, quantity of 5 at, at 80 kV versus a quantity of 10 at 60 kV. Lower kilovoltage actually produces more Brems interactions. The trick is, is that fast projectile electrons, they just scoot right on past the nucleus of an atom more easily. So it's harder to slow them down, okay? The point is, if you want to remember one thing, if you don't want to remember the graph, remember this. More x-rays are produced at low energies than high energies. Brems production goes down as the energy goes up, as the voltage settings go up, okay? So for a chest x-ray, you're actually producing less Brems radiation than for a hand x-ray. Chest x-ray is usually about 110 kV. Hand x-ray is something in about 60 kV. Chest x-ray is more energetic uh, projectile electrons. Hand x-ray is less energetic projectile electrons. Less Brems interactions as you increase voltage. Now, unfortunately, we make the most Brems radiation at the lowest voltage settings, okay? You learned that lower voltage means low kinetic energy, which means less kinetic energy to give up, okay? Meaning, at low energies, you might produce a lot of Brems x-rays, but they're low energy x-rays. Low energy x-rays, x-rays below a certain energy are just not useful to the body. Okay, they, uh, the, if below some certain energy, the x-rays would not pass through the patient's body. There is what's called a minimum voltage setting for each body part. For example, the hand's minimum voltage is 56 kV. Below about 56 kV is not enough energy, you're not producing x-rays with enough energy to get through the hand. Okay, the torso is something around 76, 75, right? doesn't really matter exactly what it is. The point is, is that there's a minimum necessary voltage to push through body parts. Below a certain voltage, you know, something in this range-ish, I'll show you in the next picture I'll show you, we don't want, even though we produce a lot of them, we don't want the Brems rays that are low energy, okay? So what we do is we produce them anyways, because we can't help but produce them. When you set 80 kV on your machine, that's your maximum voltage. That's the maximum velocity for your projectile electrons. Some of them are traveling 80 kV. Some of them are traveling with about zero kV of energy. Some of them have very, very low kinetic energy. Those ones with low kinetic energy can't give up much, okay? Your setting of your kV setting is a maximum setting, not the average, not the, not, they're not all at 80 kV, okay? This was the point of the generators, right? This is the point of having efficient generators. We set a single phase generator. If you set 90 kV, your actual voltage that you're using is about one third of that, 33-ish kV, 30-ish kV, okay? <laughs> this is only a maximum. So when you set 80, you're producing everything from zero to 80, okay? It means you're producing a bunch of Brems x-rays that are in the low energy spectrum, we don't want those. So we make them, we don't want them. If we let them out of the x-ray tube, they will not pass through the patient's body, will absorb in the patient's body, giving the patient a higher radiation dose. So we make them, we don't want them to get to the patient, so what do we do? We 
filter them out. We stop them before we get to the patient. So in this graph, we've taken away the first part of the curve. We got rid of that. We have filtered out all of the low energy, everything that would be in here, all the low energy Brems x-rays. How do we do that? Well, we take in, um, in the x-ray tube, you guys know about the window by now, right? The x-ray tube's window, the little thin spot at the bottom of the tube where the x-rays pass through. Let me show you. So that opening there is the x-ray tube's window. If you actually come up close to it and look in on it, you would be able to look up right at the cathode anode spot in the x-ray tube. They look through some oil, but there's the cathode anode right here, okay, right, right past this glass. So in an x-ray tube, we want to make sure we filter out low energy x-rays. Well, what filters out x-rays? What can stop x-rays? Lead can stop x-rays, but it does a really great job at stopping x-rays. Too good of a job, right? So we want to use a less dense material. Easy and cheap and light materials, like aluminum, are useful for this. Aluminum is really light. This, is, this aluminum is about the size of like a silver dollar or something. But I'll pass it around and say it weighs nothing. Okay, it's way lighter than your silver dollars are, so made of silver and this is made of aluminum, which is lighter. Um, the point is that this little disc of aluminum has a thickness to it. The thicker it is, the more x-rays will be stopped. So we have a specific thickness to this piece of aluminum, this filter, and that filter just sits right up here okay, in this window. So it's not clear. Your window is not clear, but x-rays don't care if your window is clear, like visible. Clear is just clear to visible light, right? X-rays don't care about clear windows. They can pass through stuff, okay? X-rays pass through matter. That's the whole point of x-rays, right? So you can put an aluminum disc in their way. The aluminum disc would stop the low energy x-rays, but the high energy ones that have enough energy just punch right on through the disc and keep going, okay? We are thereby filtering out the low energy x-rays. Here's an analogy. You go outside on a sunny day, and you see the sun in the sky, you spend some time in the sun, you get some sun exposure, you get some ultraviolet light. You go outside on a foggy day, an overcast day, same time of day, sun's at the same position in the sky, but you can't see it because it's overcast. You get some sun exposure, some exposure to UV light. Which, which instance gives you more ultraviolet exposure? The clear day, sun's bright in the sky and I can see it, or the overcast day where I can't see the sun? Overcast. Why? Why would you get more ultraviolet light exposure on an overcast day when you can't even see the sun. The light is being filtered by the clouds, right? What's not getting through the clouds? What can you not see on the overcast day? What, on the clear day, what, the big burning ball of hydrogen in the sky, we can see it, right? The sun, right? We see, and how do we know we're see? How do we know the sun's up there? We see it with our eyes, mm -hmm. and our eyes are sensitive to what kind of light? The lower, the lower. The we're lower. getting there, yeah. But our eyes are sensitive to ultraviolet light. No, your eyes are sensitive to visible light, right? So you see the sun in the sky. You know you can see the sun in the sky. You know, you know the sun's in the sky when you can see it. If you can see it, that means visible light is getting from the sun to you. That yellow light that you see is getting to you. On an overcast day. Is the visible light getting to you anymore? No, right? The, and you guys figured this out already. The clouds in the sky are filtering out the visible light. And what's it letting through? The ultraviolet light that you cannot see. And okay? because ultraviolet has more energy. Exactly. Ultraviolet light is more energetic. Said in the way that we like to talk about it from here forward, <laughs> ultraviolet light has a shorter wavelength than visible light. You get struck by more waves of visible light, excuse me, of ultraviolet light in uh, one fraction of time than you would with visible light. Do you ever have a, a, a filter failure? The filters, um, so this doesn't fail. What does fail is, remember that we talked about tungsten vaporizing on the, on the walls of the glass and stuff like that? So over time, your x-ray tubes actually build up filtration because of deposits of tungsten on the glass. So over time, your x-ray tubes get more and more filtrating, which means, so go back to the analogy of foggy day versus sunny day, right? It's more dangerous on the foggy day, right? So over time, your x-ray tube 
the beam it creates gets more and more hardened. More and more of the beam is filled, more and more of the low energy beam is filtered out, so more and more of the high energy stuff's making it through. So as your x-ray tube ages, your x-ray beam gets more dangerous, more penetrating to the body. So you don't have filter failure, you have filter filtration increase as the x-ray tube ages. Because so, of deposits on the glass. So your your image just eventually becomes whiter. Um, it will become black. Blacker with blacker. more um, a yeah, we'll say that, yeah, darker. Yeah, yeah. More density, yeah, as as you go. So your factors actually change. Hang on, that my phone is like going off the hook here. Okay. Um, so you actually change in the, the extra tubes changes in the energy it produces over time. But again, the point was, the reason why this graph doesn't have that first part of the curve is because we used a filter to take out those low energy x-rays, which would otherwise just contribute to patient dose. What the correct thing to say is they're non-diagnostic x-rays, so we don't want them. All x-ray tubes use an aluminum filter. All x-ray tubes have some inherent filtration. Between the inherent filtration built into the glass and the oil and stuff like that, and the aluminum disc, there's about two and a half millimeters total of, of, of filtration of aluminum. So we measure a filtration with millimeters of aluminum, and the x-ray tubes usually have a minimum of two and a half millimeters of aluminum filtration. The aluminum disc is usually about a millimeter thick. I'm just gonna pass this around so you guys can see it. Let me give something else with it so you guys can have some uh, context here. This is a, a lead coin cut to roughly the same size as, it's, it's a lead mat, but it, coin size, roughly the same size as that. You can compare them in their weights. Pause it just a second so you guys can hold these two things in, the, in your hand at the same time um, and compare the different weights. Notice how much heavier lead is than, uh, than the aluminum. All right, Brems x-rays were part of the story. Let me, um, let me pause for just a moment.